What's up, YouTube? Pink Reaper here, uh, back with another episode of, or the next part, I should say, of Pokemon 101. I am currently in a Skype call with, um, my, I don't even know what to call you, my teaching assistant, Umbreon Mao. Could just be your friend. Yeah, well, like, yo, that's a step up from where you are. I don't think we're gonna be quite here. Uh, <laughs> my friend Max, uh, as well as our good friend, Gay Birdfeet. No, wait, <laughs> Kevin. Kevin, that's his name. Mathos. Mathos, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll respond to either, what's up? He goes by Mathos on Smashboards, if you've ever been to Smashboards. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, linear versus non-linear teams in this episode. I touched on it briefly in the, the, the intro to team building videos. Um, but Max and I had been talking before, before we started recording. We have very different opinions on what is and isn't a linear team. Um, so we'll be discussing... Uh, both our viewpoints, sort of trying to come to agreement, or if not, that's fine too, because discussion is better than... How did I word that earlier? I don't even remember. Hey, it's your points, man. I can't remember. I'm so bad at teaching. Like, <clears throat> who gave me my, my credentials? But anyways, um, it is of my opinion, my personal opinion, that a non-linear team is a team that, that plays outside of the uh, the... God, I need to bring up my. I I can't. The problem is I can't bring up my text because then it'll take over the whole video, and I don't want any, everyone seeing the whole Skype video. Um, the text you sent me. Yeah. No. Not not like you know, just the Skype chat that we had before. Um, uh, a nonlinear team is a play, team that plays uh, outside of the immediate turn. It has. A, it's a team that was built with a strategy going into it, and plays plays with that strategy. As opposed to a linear team, which is just a team of six Pokemon that just sort of do whatever they have to do. Um, I described my, I described the rain team I made in the in the last video um, as a very linear team. It has six Pokemon that just sort of do whatever they have to do. Um, it allows for it allows for easy switching because obviously it's still a well-made team. It has good type coverage and synergy and stuff like that. But it's not a team with a strategy going into it other than have rain up, win with rain. Um, Max is of a very different opinion on that. Max, your opinion on linear teams? Oh, I have a full write-up. I was going to go for it. Do you want me to just start? Yeah, go, you can do the full write-up because I I wanted to, but I can't because I don't want to have it take up the whole like the whole screen. Oh, okay. Uh, my idea on linear linearity for Pokemon is more to do with the number of feasible play options that you have at any given point in the game. Nonlinear teams tend to have more viable decisions over the course of a game, while linear teams tend to have fewer. The trade-off here is that the linear teams tend to have stronger terms. So the way I was describing it is thinking about playing around something as opposed to playing through something. Uh, linear strategies are usually best identified by how the team is built. So linear would be identified by the use of Pokemon with, say, a typical stat base, it's like a higher speed, a higher attack, or something. Uh, choice band, choice scarf, those kind of items, or different uh, EV spread distributions. Nonlinear strategies are usually better identified by Pokemon with like more balanced stats, uh, more versatile items, and strategic placement of your EV spread distributions to accomplish specific things. So the example I was giving of a linear Pokemon would be something like Choice Band Scissor. Choice Band Scissor, um, basically what you're doing is you reduce the options. The, the Scissor player has fewer options at any given point, but you're increasing the potency of what Scissor is able to do. So you have a high base attack stat of 130, you have your choice band, and a heavy focus towards hit points and attack very much tells you that the scissor player is only trying to accomplish essentially one of two things. They're trying to hit something really hard, or they're trying to double switch, I guess. Um, this is opposed to, say, a nonlinear Pokemon, like the example I have is Jirachi. The Jirachi I pulled up for the Gen 5, the standard build, was Leftovers with uh, Thunderbolt, Psyshock, Calm Mind, and Substitute. And at any point, you have more options with this Jirachi, especially if like your team is built to match it. Um, but you're not really your turns aren't as potent as answering, say, Choice Band Scissor immediately. Um, you'll notice that Jirachi still has a high base stat total, but it's balanced with 100 in every stat. Uh, Leftovers is a very versatile item. You're not locked on any one move or any one particular strategy. And this particular build has uh, 252 HP, 100 defense, 152 speed. So your EV spread is still pretty well balanced, somewhere between survivability and speed. Um, 
I think it's important to understand that the idea of linear and nonlinear is a gradient more than a classification. It's like teams are just linear or nonlinear by nature. Successful teams usually have some aspect of both depending on their composition. Um, because of the larger dynamic at play, linear strategies tend to focus on specific goal, I guess. And the idea behind uh, thematic teams such as drizzle teams, uh, trick room teams, baton pass teams all fall into this example. Uh, I did pull up an example of a nonlinear team that I found. Chris, do you have that handy? Uh, the oh right, yeah, the um, the team I built just now. Well, the, yeah. The, the time yeah. when you have it up. Yeah, I've got it up right now. Okay, so the team that I pulled up um, is an example of it, what I see as a nonlinear team. Uh, nonlinear teams are basically built to answer possible threats given a range of possible game states. This generally means that nonlinear teams have Pokemon with more bulk to enable switching as an option more often because you want to keep your lines of play open. These teams generally end up lengthening the game state as a general way to allow the player more opportunities to leverage an advantage over the opponent. The team I gave Chris is a Gen 4 team from early 2009. It's built by a player named Panamaxis. It was uh, very highly ranked for a good period of time. Uh, consider it a snapshot in time for the metagame. It was built to answer a range of offensive and defensive threats in a flexible manner throughout the course of the game. The Pokemon have bulk and the type coverage to reasonably handle diverse offense, offensive uh, threat base. But even more interestingly, the team is naturally built to handle stall teams. So if you look at the Pokemon, um, only Gyarados and Salamence on the six are weak to Stealth Rock. <clears throat> Gyarados, Latias, Salamence, and Azoth are all immune to spikes, and all six Pokemon are immune to, to toxic spikes, and all these really add up to reducing residual damage over the length of the game, uh, allowing you to finesse out an advantage against the opponent. Uh, so, for example, I have the threat of the offense and defensive threat base for the, the metagame at that time. So, Chris, just name some popular Pokemon from Gen 4, and we'll see if we can answer them with that team that you have in front of you that I can't see. Okay, so let's start with, let's go with the most obvious, the the absolute most obvious um, threats from Gen 4, which were Scissor Tran. Um, you you know, 30% of every team you're going to run into these two Pokemon, um, Heatran and Scizor. Heatran is generally answered with Latias and Gyarados. Whereas Scissor, you uh, you generally want to stick to Gyarados. Scissor can do okay if it's if it has good health. Um, Azelf isn't killed by bullet punch and kill in return with flamethrower if it's at full health. But either way, like both of those Pokemon have multiple answers to them. Do you have uh, any others? Let's. Well, yeah, I was gonna say let's just keep moving down. So yeah, uh, sure. Defensive threats work too. It's things that you might. Oh see yeah, on that's what teams. I was going to next. The, uh, okay. the the third of the Holy Trinity and one of the most like common defensive Pokemon, which would be a Rotom H. Uh, I don't think Rotom was actually played in stall teams that heavily at this point. It's not really noted. Well, uh, it's not, for, it's not necessarily that it has to be a stall like a stall team. It's just Rotom H is the most was the most common defensive Pokemon um, for a lot of teams, even if the team wasn't wasn't defense oriented. Um, and it's still it was still the the most common defensive Pokemon you'd run into. <laughs> the way Rotom is, Rotom itself is also equally nonlinear. So the general strategy against Rotom is to not get burned. In this case, your best bets would probably be Azel, or to stick to special attacking with Latias and uh, Psycho Shift. Do you have Latias in front of you? Uh, I I do. I have I have the whole team in front of me right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Latias was specifically given Psycho Shift to act as a status absorber, so it could switch into things like Togekiss or Stunned Wave or Rotom's Will O Wisp, which Rotom's Will O Wisp and um, its general bulk are the most threatening aspects uh, to this team, so being able to handle Will O Wisp is pretty big. Uh, Latias and Azel probably do the best there. Alright. Um, this is one obviously I brought up the other day, and we both know it wasn't particularly common at the time. Um, so we're not going to talk specifically Babiritar here, but how does this team deal well with Tyranitar? This one should be obvious. Uh, it says they're supposed to one-hit kill with Bullet Punch. Uh, Metagross can come in on Stone Edge. Uh, Gyarados does well with Aqua Tail and Earthquake, and Scissor does well at taking Stab Crunches. Uh, this team doesn't have Aqua Tail or Earthquake uh, Gyarados. It has DD Waterfall St Stone Edge Bounce. You're thinking of your own Gyarados. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
Well, intimidate and waterfall. I mean, those are pretty typical answers for Gyarados, though. Um, obviously, Babiri Tar would, assuming Metagross is out of the game already, as most leads tended to be in fourth gen, because Suicide Lead was the, the the name of the game back then. Um, Babiri Tar would sort of wreck most of this team, but it, it could at least manage with some uh, with some easy with some good switches and that double intimidate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's go m more defensive threats again. Let's say um, uh, Swampert. Uh, Swampert usually comes in on Salamence, and you generally want Draco Meteor to take it out. Uh, Metagross can explode, and Azelf does well, uh, unless it has like Surf, Waterfall, Avalanche, whatever. Uh, Latias does well if it has uh, Ice Beam, too. Um, how do you deal with Stockpile Hippowdon? I don't think Hippowdon is generally on the standard threat list, actually. Hippowdon's usage is pretty low. I mean, it's a good Pokemon, but it's generally not something you prepare for. No, no, that was just like a, a general question. How on earth do you deal with Stockpile Hippo? Hmm. Uh, honestly, I didn't build this team. So I guess the best answer here would probably be to stick to... Yeah, probably Latias and Gyarados again. God, that you, Pokemon... you generally want to stick to the water. Stockpile Hippo was so good. Why did no one ever use that? Um, There's a lot of static Pokemon that are really good because they're really hard to deal with by a, with a phaser. Yeah, those are two really good ones. Tyranitar and Hippo. To that end, um, to that end, how do you deal with um, Suicune? Uh, Suicune, uh, Suicune generally tends to be defensive. Uh, you want to explode on it with Metagross if that's at all an option. Uh, Azel Psychics once or twice can uh, on how many call um, how many Calm Minds the Suicune has, and then you can explode on it as well. And you can also go for the Special Defense drop. Uh, if it comes in on Salamence, Draco Meteor plus Outrage will significantly weaken it, and then you can trade one for one and then finish it off with something else. I think, what else was uh, what else were the top tier threats in Gen 4? I can think of a lot of Pokemon that were common in OU, but not necessarily that were top, like, that, that were threats, really, so much as they were just heavily used Pokemon. There's a bunch of Pokemon that are uh, very offensive, especially on the fire side, like Heatran and Infernape, where your best bet is to stick to Latios and Gyarados, but in that respect, Gyarados gets a lot of work in, in what it has to cover on this team. Yeah. <laughs> I always hate having to try and... I always hate trying to... Um, well, this is more This is more nowadays when um, in Gen 5 when like a lot a lot other... A lot of like sets you didn't necessarily see too much in Gen 4 actually get played, like Scarf Infernape is now more common and thing like you know Scarf U turn Infernape and things like that. Um, yeah, sure. I hate switching into Infernape. It's just something I don't like trying to do. Nothing really like switching into Infernape. Uh, but that's a whole other thing. Um, I was trying to build because um, let's go back. Let's go back to your um, to your definition of nonlinear again. Uh, the Pokemon with <coughs> uh, with more atypical um, or no no not atypical. Uh, yeah, atypical EV spreads, things like that. Because um, we were we were actually talking about this just before we started um, started the the recording. Was my old my old anti lead Bronzong? Um, I really wish I could remember the EVs because I can't remember them off the top of my head. You know, it was super specific. It was like um, the move set's more important. Yeah. Oh no no the EVs on this were also really important because I had like a specific amount of special attack uh, for one thing, a specific amount of. Um, Special defense for another thing and things like that. Um, on the screen right now, I have my old, my old uh, anti lead Bronzong. This was something I ran in fourth gen. Um, this was probably the most successful lead I ever had in any metagame, um, unless you count old lead Wobbuffet. But we're not going to get into that because that was just stupid. Um, I ran a heatproof Bronzong with four attacks as my lead in Gen four. Um, I. I the reason for this was at the time the most the most common leads were um, Heatran, Infernape, Azelf, um, and Aerodactyl. I was trying to remember what the <laughs> trying to remember the thing's name. Uh, as well as for more defensive teams, you would see Swampert most frequently, and then occasionally Hippowdon. I had four attacks on my my Bronzong. I had Earthquake, Explosion, Grass Knot, and Gyro Ball. I was EV'd specifically, so I could never be too hit KO'd by um, Infernape or Heatran, unless it was like Specs overheat Heatran, in which case, yeah, I could totally do, totally do it to me. Great lead. Um, 
But if that was the case, I mean, that's just like one of the most obscenely abusable Pokemon you can take advantage of on your opponent's team. Uh, yeah. I Shut was up, EV'd in special attack specifically so that I could um, deal 57% damage to hip out on. Um, so it literally couldn't do anything. Like, um, it, it, it was something that essentially forced hip out on to switch out while it had taken, uh, uh, well, you know, while it had taken damage, um, well, without being able to do anything to me. Um, it did 90 something percent to, um, Swampert, which was awesome, obviously. Um, but the important thing was that it also understood that the, the most common thing people did to Bronzong at the beginning of games was, um, taunting it. So taunt Azelf and taunt, um, taunt Aerodactyl would both be would have both Wait be two turn. Hit, yeah, two hit KO'd by Gyro Ball, and I'd be left with obviously a 100% uh, HP hip out or Bronzong that is still capable of countering the Fire type Pokemon they bring in against it. Um, this is this was this was probably like the the shining example of your definition for non-linearity in a team in a Pokemon. Yeah, that's great. Um, and uh, to that to that extent, I will agree with you. But the thing is, th this is the big this is the big dis disagreement we had on these um, the the idea of a nonlinear team. I don't really feel like a team of nonlinear Pokemon really um, dictate a nonlinear team. A team of nonlinear Pokemon is still generally played like a linear team. You it, it just forces more prediction almost. I almost feel like it's worse. Uh, we you did say that obviously it's better to have a mix of both linear and nonlinear, and in fact that um, that team the uh, your your um, example of a nonlinear team obviously does have that choice band scissor in there. That really, um, obviously, the really obvious Pokemon, the really nonlinear, the really linear Pokemon, um, yeah. and the same can kind of be said about Metagross. I mean, it's literally just built to um, set up Stealth Rocks and then be Metagross. Yep. Um, it is a very linear Pokemon. It, I mean, it, it has no type coverage whatsoever. It has double double steel and explosion. Um, but it, it's definitely I, I mean the way you the way you describe nonlinearity I definitely agree with you with you there um, for this team but the thing is I don't necessarily describe nonlinearity the same way. Um, well, this goes back to linearity as a gradient, whereas your team would be slightly more linear than this, but definitely not as much so as say a baton pass team or a trick room team. Um, you can still have nonlinearity aspects built into a team, which I'm sure your team has, and you still keep some number of lines op open. And you can you can still use finesse to come up with a different game state. So, example, one of the past videos that you just put up is where you have the Breloom six of the other person's team. Well, that's a good example of that. You used a lot of nonlinear aspects to set up this linear game state where you can still go through it. But there's definitely aspects of both. Yeah, I got you. It's just it, the thing is obviously um, with my line of thinking is I consider um, how should I put it. I don't necessarily consider teams to be nonlinear. I consider the gameplay to be nonlinear. Uh, sure. And as such, that's why I obviously put more focus on um, the team building and the team strategy when the team is being built. Um, I don't like having to predict in my games. Um, prediction generally is this will be a, this. I mean, prediction is going to have its own actual video. That one prediction video I put up was just sort of like um, a proof of concept video. Um, I will do a whole prediction video on its own, but. Prediction tends to be at best a guess with you know some amount of education for it. It's an educated guess at best. At worst, it's a it's a blind guess. You're just hoping for one thing over the other. Um, and a a team that is a team is that is built even nonlinear like nonlinearly like this generally puts itself in a position where it has to it has to guess a lot. Like, do you switch? Do you use this attack? Do you use this attack? You have a lot of options, but the problem is if you, if it, those options aren't focused enough, it's still going to put you in bad positions. Um, I guess switching over to my team that I'll show. This, I, I've never actually talked about my my Gen Four team um, on uh, on my on on my channel really. I've never gone over it. I've never really explained it. I did that. I've done it a few times on um, like on AIM with random people um, from you know from Smashboard from the Pokemon Center and all that. Um, but I've never, and obviously with you, but I've never really talked about this team um, to my subscribers. I've never really explained what this team is or how it came about. Um, as a team, this team was built um, with with a strategy behind it. It it wasn't that 
I was going to go in and have six Pokemon that are just really strong and hope they win. It was, I was going to have Pokemon specifically made to, to force specific situations that I knew my team would be able to win out of. Um, generally, if you've watched me play any of my Pokemon vids, uh, in any of my Pokemon vids, there's always a moment where Breloom gets in on a slow Pokemon. And it, I mean, obviously that's what you want to do with Breloom, but what a lot of people don't realize is this team was built specifically for that to happen. Um, it was a Gen 4 team originally, so there was no team preview. Um, so I have, like, big offensive threats in my top three Pokemon as Metagross, Scizor, and Tyranitar. Things you would want to switch slow, um, slow steel type Pokemon into, you'd want to switch Swampert into. Um, and that was the idea. I had, you know, I could explode out with Metagross, I could U-turn out with Scizor, and it would just get me in that Breloom. And Breloom opens up and a, like an immense amount of free turns, obviously, with that 100% accurate sleep, um, essentially destroying one Pokemon and then allowing me a free hit on another. Um, and obviously, free turns is the most is obviously the most powerful thing you can have in in Pokemon. If you have a free turn, you you are at the biggest advantage already. Um, and then Breloom plays into Zapdos. The idea here is Breloom um, can either outright take out Swampert, which is the, the biggest threat, or at the very least put it to sleep, so it's not really a threat to Zapdos. Um, I put Br Zapdos on this team to work specifically with Breloom. Um, so everything prediction-wise was done while I built the team. It wasn't done in the video. It wasn't done in gameplay. It's done outside of gameplay. Um, so I guess I guess really, really the big difference we come up on is that you describe nonlinearity as the team itself. I describe nonlinearity as the gameplay. Um, I think it's both. Fine, be that way. Just ruin my argument right like that. I, th I think it's basically what you're going for. I think in a previous video you mentioned that like linear teams are easier to play to a point, but then against better players it become hard to play. And that, that kind of goes back to the argument of what you're saying, that you have these educated guesses or whatever. Like, yeah, you'll get in a point where you have to make these, these hard decisions or whatever, and sometimes you'll get yourself into a bad position. But if you're a talented player and you have a nonlinear team, there's a lot of times where you can educated guess your way out of a bad situation instead. And at the higher end of gameplay, your win rate goes up for it dramatically because your skill level starts to show off that way. But you need to you need to consider the the um, you need to consider that that's that's true. But you need to consider that it's only true for high level versus mid level. Um, like, if you're assuming that high-level players are the ones that predict more properly, a high-level versus a high-level opponent, um, obviously they're both they're both equally capable of um, of that same prediction. Yeah, um, but if you're a skilled player, why wouldn't you give your more, yourself more turns to try to outplay your opponent? I am, you don't really want the game to be as short as possible. You want it to go to go long, so you can so your opponent can screw up when you don't. I guess, but that's that's the same thing going back to the you know the the idea that y you you won't and they will. Uh, I'm much like that's that's how I built my team. I much prefer not not being in that situation. I much prefer uh, I much prefer having already predicted everything before the game even starts. Um, and that's also why I said Gen Five made this team even more broken. Uh, being able to see my opponent's entire team, like see what I will know what they have to switch into Breloom, and I know. What will force that Pokemon out, um, which is retarded? It's not something that like you should give. It's not something you should give to a player in this situation. Um, and then um, I guess I should also point out that's that's true for five sixths of my team. I put Infernape on there because Infernape is busted. Um, Infernape fits your uh, definition of nonlinear perfectly. That's a, that's a Pokemon you just don't want to have to deal with at any given point. Mm, I won't go that far. Uh, Infernape is generally pretty imbalanced towards offense away from defense. Well, yeah, that's definitely true. And also, I should, despite saying that, actually, Gen 5 introduced a Pokemon that was almost... I, I almost feel it was in, in, introduced specifically for Infernape. Uh, I don't know if you've run into it yet, but Jellicent, the ghost water-type Pokemon? Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just the obvious anti-Infernape. I mean, to be fair, they kind of needed one. They really did. Um, yeah. But Especially like, even then, that, that's balance. just a, that's another Pokemon that I um, like. It's something I can I can bring Infernape in on something, and then it's like, oh, your your clear only option here is to go to Jellicent. So now I have my Breloom. Um, 
my my grass fighting type uh, that I guess actually doesn't perfectly counter it, but whatever. I've got spore, spore all the things. Um, I do think that uh, a good prediction is just a key component to play, regardless of what team type you're using. And just as much as ramming choice band scissor at your opponent and forcing them to deal with it and minimizing their options is probably equally as good as playing something like your own call mind suit and increasing your own mind supply. Yeah, I can agree with that. There's a and bunch think, of merits to playing both. And it, it's also I'm also not going to say that prediction is necess like is like is always bad. Like I, I kind of I kind of feel like earlier I was I was saying like you know I dislike predicting I you know it's a guess at best but the thing is prediction is still a powerful tool and there are plenty of opportunities where um ne where you don't necessarily need to predict but doing it won't harm you especially early game a lot of people say early game prediction is bad um I sort of disagree just because um in early game generally a misprediction isn't going to to cost you as much as it is a late game prediction People put more weight into late game prediction because it's what can save you, but the problem is an improper late game prediction is also what can what can lose the game for you. I'd much prefer getting you know getting a huge advantage right at the beginning, and then uh, and then you know riding that momentum, keeping those free turns. Then, um, but then I mean, you however you make favorable exchanges is going to be valuable regardless of the game state, pretty much. So, yeah, that's yeah. true. I can't see why prediction would be bad in the early game. Um, Unless you're really terrible either. at it. <laughs> Um, then you get I, set up on. Get set up on. No, uh, yeah, you can't. You you can't be bad with your predictions. Like, um, never. You but I I don't want to start getting into that because that's going to be its own prediction. Like I said, its own prediction video. Um, I'm gonna have to go like into choice Pokemon and things like that when I do that video. Um, yeah, sure, but it, it's still fundamentally related. Just oh no, because it's, of, it's of how the team builds use yeah. prediction to their advantage. Well, like like I said, a non-linear team like. Let's go back to your. Let's go back to that team. The um, the I'm calling it the Pokemon 101 Advanced Class. Um, the Advanced Class team, um, uh, it is a well. In some ways, it is a very prediction heavy team. Um, it is. Especially like when you consider like Azelf and and Scizor, or not Scizor. Yeah, Scizor is a very prediction heavy team. Uh, Pokemon no, Azelf and Latio specifically. Um, not so not so much Mixmence because Mixmence is pretty much capable of throwing out an attack and whatever comes into it, it can still throw out another attack and generally trade favorably. Um, but like, that also depends. Yeah, it I, know, I know, the but it still does get hit by sand. It still does have to deal with priority. Yeah, oh no, I know. I'm saying change. generally. Um, it, it <laughs> I'm not someone who thinks that Salamence ne needs to be banned. Let's just put it like that. Um, yeah, I don't either. But like when you're playing with something like like Latias, um, you know that only has Surf and Draco Meteor to it, um, or when you're playing with Azelf, who can only really rely on that special attacking stat, um, you, I mean, obviously there's things that can that are just going to be able to straight up wall that. But we're not going to, we're not really going to talk about Blissey. We need to talk about like things like, um, um, like in Latias's case, um, Tarantar. Um, obviously, Tarantar is a huge threat to that Latias. Even with Surf, it, she's in no way going to be able to. Um, I, she's not going to be able to two-hit KO it. Um, and the same is the same is th true for Azelf. Azelf obviously can't. Um, Azelf obviously can't two-hit KO a Tyranitar. So if you know, you know, when you know your opponent has that, or if, even if you just assume you have that, you have that. Like, like, are they going to switch to that Tyranitar? Are they going to? It's you're in positions where you need you need to have. You need to have that. Um, you need to have that prediction going for you. And even with something like Gyarados, you know that free turn, that free that prediction of a free turn switch versus not that Dragon Dance versus not Dragon Dance. Um, you don't. Your Pokemon. Your Pokemon don't support themselves well. Is what I what I kind of want to say here is um, they rely on their teams to support them. Like you have the options to deal with things. With yep. other Pokemon, but you're but those individuals don't necessarily. What do you mean? Well, um, I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't want to. I don't want to talk fifth gen meta metagame because I know this team was built fourth game metagame or fourth gen metagame, and that's just, just sort the of generic theoretical terms. So, like a lot of the Pokemon on this team, they're still very potent on their own. 
you don't really want to switch into things like Draco Meteor, and you don't really want to switch into Dragon Dance, or you don't want to switch anything to Azelf really too much of the time. No, Azelf's a pretty easy. If anything, I feel like Azelf's the easiest to switch in on your team. Yeah, and that kind of says something by itself. You don't want to switch into something that has 125 of both attack stats. You don't want to switch into that as the easiest switch in. Oh, no, I'll always switch into that. But then that's that's just an Azelf thing. Um, well then, when you, so when you're when you're saying that yeah, th this team has issues with Tyranitar. Well, that's where the old joke used to came up with. If you don't have a Tyranitar counter, if your gets gets a roll. Dragon Dance, you're screwed. I you know, that. I, I actually things. remember that. If if Tyranitar gets a Dragon t Dance, you lose. Um, that's yeah, actually well, that's really true joke. for this team. Um, yep, but, that's true for every team though. That's why it's fun. Well, yes and no. Um, there are, but um, but no, I'm saying like. Azelf specifically, Azelf has that awesome 125 base attacking stat, but the only thing it really has to take advantage of that is Explosion. Um, and I guess it's okay if... That's that's a good good thing and a bad thing. Azelf can explode and take out you know one of its counters, but the problem is its counters are generally things that are special defen specially defensive, um, and you don't necessarily have anything else on your team that takes advantage of that either. Um, right. I think Azelf was chosen specifically for this team as another offensive Pokemon that bypasses Andrew Hazards more than uh, having other outside defensive coverage. Um, but anyway, like going back to what I was saying earlier, like Gyarados, obviously Gyarados is a ridiculously powerful Pokemon. You don't want to, you never want to switch in, into like say Dragon Dance, but Skarmory can do that fine because you're no longer, because Gyarados doesn't support itself to set up that Dragon Dance. It, it doesn't have that taunt to stop something from phasing it. Yeah, I personally never liked Gyarados without Taunt, but I think that's just one of my things. It, it, yeah, no, it's I no, I fully understand it, and it's not. I mean, obviously, it's not like your team doesn't have ways of dealing with Skarmory, but the fact of the matter is, like Gyarados, you have to switch. Yeah, yeah. you have to switch. Um, but then it, it comes down to that that like, well, do I switch assuming Skarmory is going to come in, or do I go for that dragon? Like. You're putting yourself in positions where you need to predict. I don't like having to predict. I like using U-turn and going straight into Breloom and having my setup ready. <laughs> Prediction is a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, if you don't want to predict and that's one of your strengths, then by all means you should play to it. But there's a lot of cases where you should exploit prediction as much as possible and also play to it. Oh, it's. I mean, we both know I can predict. We've both seen my crazy, like, my, like, retarded live stream video where I literally just predicted everything my opponent would do. Um... But it's just, there's, I never like being in a position, let's just put it like this, I don't like being in a position where I have to predict. Um, yeah, sure. There's being nothing able wrong to predict that. and having to predict are two different, entirely different things. Um, yep. And obviously, like, one of the strengths of this team is it doesn't necessarily have to predict frequently, um, but the problem is it also relies on prediction a lot, um, which will put you more frequently into that position where you have to, where you have to rely on a prediction. Um it's still not. It's still a team that's very capable of of working without prediction, but there's plenty of situations where you would need to as well. It was a number one number one ranked team for like three months, I believe. That's impressive. Yeah, it's really good. It's a really well built team. Um, and I'm going to be completely honest. That's the uh, Metagross that I'm, with the exception of that leftovers. That is the Metagross that I've been running as my lead for God knows how long. Um, ever since people. Ever since people stopped using things that my uh, my anti lead Bronzong could could beat. Um, you're you uh you use Lumberry though, right? Yeah, I use Lum. I use Lum. I also use Lumberry. At the time when this team was made, uh, just when Platinum had come out, and due to Hypnosis' drop in accuracy, Sleep Leads weren't really used anymore at that time. So leftovers would prevent Yon Mega from two hit killing it, and usually when Metagross can hang around a while, you get to explode more, yeah, and that's well, why it was switched to leftovers over Lumberry. Um, admittedly though, like in um, oh no, actually now, no, 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 no. I, I, I need, to, I need to actually clarify this. I didn't use um, I didn't use this Metagross specifically. I've been u I've been using this Metagross um, like at the tail end of Gen four and then all through Gen five, um, into the into the you know the early DPP into like late Gen four. I actually was using um, I was using Earthquake, Meteor Mash, Explosion, Stealth Rocks with a. Uh, with an Oka Berry. Yeah. I was, using anti legitimate. I was using anti fire lead. Um, yeah, and course. the best part about anti fire lead is that I was frequently finding myself wishing I had a Shuckaberry. 
Yeah, a lot of the time against um, Infernape or like uh, Heatran leads, if for this team you would just switch to Latias or you just Stealth Rock if you think they want to attack for whatever reason. So like you can both throw down Stealth Rock's first turn. Yeah. Um, man, your team is... That team is actually very, very good. Yeah, it's really well built. It's really well, cool. Well, That's why I found it. It's just I'm starting to remember I'm starting to remember how good Gyarados was against Scissor Train on its own. Yeah. Um, too bad about that Stealth Rock's weakness. Um, God, you know what's Clearly funny? Is, the answer is to lead with it. You know what's funny is I just have you seen my um have you seen my Sun Team the 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 I think I did like one game with it. I haven't seen it yet. No. Um. It's another one where, it sort of like, I just sort of thought of everything that, uh, like that I expected my opponents to do before I even built the team, and I just built the team under those like under those predictions, um, and honestly, it's come true quite a bit. Um, but like, it's another like, despite saying that, and despite like that sort of fitting into my my like uh like non-linear strategy, I honestly feel like it's a very linear team. Like I just sort of have six Pokemon that do whatever. It is a they have weather to do. team, to be fair. Huh? It is a weather team, to be fair. Yeah. Well, um, it's also Nine Tails, Heatran, Gyarados, Roserade, Golurk, and Latios. Yeah, you added a, a lot of non-linearity to it, which is probably the best way to go. That's why, like, I think Ice Team should be like Obama Snow and maybe one other Ice Pokemon and then four normal Pokemon. Yeah, like. It sort of it sort of goes it sort of goes like I feel like this is the opposite of my my Gen Four team in that it's a very non-linear it's it's a very it's a set of non-linear Pokemon building a very linear team, whereas my Gen Four team is very is a, a set of very linear Pokemon building a non-linear team. Yeah, as long as you incorporate aspects of both, because you still want the power, but you still want to maintain options too. That's like uh, the reason the bulky offense teams lead with dual screen, life clay, Azel. It's because having double defenses for eight turns significantly increases your lines of play for those eight turns while still keeping all the power behind it. Five turns. Light clay? Ex yeah, but you have to set them up and then you have to explode out. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry, that's that's something that always bothered me. I don't. Whenever I saw, um, like, um, um, team overviews when they're talking about when they, when they ran dual screen leads and they're like, Eight turns of screens, I'd always think five turns. Real men do dual screens and then they switch out so they can do it later. I know. Let's be honest. When you have dual screens up, you can switch pretty free. Yeah. Well, that's that's great to have that option. Because then your opponent still has to deal with your Pokemon. They still have to deal with the fact that you can make better play decisions, too. You don't necessarily have to just play through them. Yeah. Kevin, are you still there? No, Kevin went to bed. Did he really? I mean, Mathos went to bed. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, say, I thought we, I thought we lost him. Yeah, we did. Uh, he was one who he was going to be the uh, he was going to be the stand-in for all of my subscribers who were just sort of barely learning about Pokemon, and also he said he wanted to learn about or no, he said he, his girlfriend wanted to learn about Pokemon, didn't he? Yeah, but she wants to learn from me. Uh, that's I don't know. If, um, I I think Kevin should be worried. Nah. Um, I'm not in the white girls. <laughs> this is true. We're not going to go into that conversation though. Not on not on the Pokemon. Not program. again. Not again either. <laughs> uh, do we have anything else really to cover? Um, uh, I don't think so. We pretty much beat this team to death. I know. We didn't really come to a conclusive argument or a conclusive stance on what linearity actually means. So we're just going to really confuse your audience. Mm, I don't know. I mean, it's fine. I, it's cool because they're my videos. I can still just say whatever I want it to be and that's just how it's going to be. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I honestly feel like... Um, the pro it, it doesn't feel like necessarily that I feel like one of us is wrong. I don't. I just feel like both of us are right. We're it's agreeing just, to we're, disagree. Yeah, we're just we're just. It, it just seems like we're um, uh, we're talking about two different aspects, really. Like you're you're talking specifically about Pokemon. I'm talking specifically about gameplay. Um, and yes, I know they're not mutually exclusive, and I know you're talking a little bit about both, but. Your focus is more on the Pokemon, and my focus is more on the gameplay. Yeah. Well, I mean, generally, you want your Pokemon to do what you build them to do, which is why we give them specific spreads and items and moves in the first place. Yeah. But yeah, then, so it's essentially the same thing. To that end, 
to that end, I want to say. To that end, I want to say that both of both of our uh, both of our definitions are right. Um, you yours is a non yours is literally nonlinear Pokemon, and mine is literally nonlinear team play. Um, obviously, you can do both. Or I mean, well, no, you can't. I mean, how you play mid match is just going to be whether you're doing something good or something bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you still, you regardless of what you're playing, you still want to play well. Yeah, this is always true. Yeah, so you should just pick whatever strategy you should be doing at that time. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's like I, prediction. Prediction. I mean, is because it, because good. it's me and because it's my videos and because this is how um, I've always described nonlinear. I'll probably consider. I'll probably. No, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to start splitting this up. Maybe I'll make. I'll, maybe I actually will end up making that. Um, that terms video, the uh, jargon video, the. Basically, just explaining everything that we've been talking about for everyone who really doesn't know. Uh, I have a diplomatic idea. I, I just didn't about, want to do the super super basics, just because I feel like everyone like there's better there's better um, there's better shit to talk about. Yeah. No. Well, yes, there's better stuff to talk about, but there's also better sources for that. Like, there's better better ways to learn the super super basics than going through me. There's some very in depth guides and stuff like that on it. Um, yeah. But. I will say that your your definition of linearity I like. It's definitely a version. It's definitely a definition of linearity I agree with, but it's a definition for linear nonlinear Pokemon essentially. Um, having six nonlinear Pokemon does not necessarily dictate that you have a nonlinear team. In the same way, I I like mine, but I also feel like yours is still slightly more right than mine. I don't know. I know. There's I no, think there, there's not I a think, really good way to like um, to decide that unless I guess subscribers cast a vote right now. One that's for my definition, what I was say. two for Max's yeah. definition. What was that? Yeah. Have, have people just post their ideas and maybe we can learn from them too. Maybe both of us are wrong. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it's cool. Amazing Ampharos will come in and tell us everything we're wrong about. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, I don't want to get in on. I don't want to get in on AA though. I I have a lot of disagreements with AA about random things. I have a lot of agreements with him about random things. Yeah, you he doesn't like know that because I just read it. But yeah, you you seem that you seem like that kind of person. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but no, I I guess I mean to be completely honest, I'll probably end up sticking with your definition for nonlinear teams because my definition really is more about nonlinear gameplay. Yeah, I mean, if, if something just has a die, you should definitely just try to kill it. Yeah, but that's also that's also another like prediction thing I'm gonna go into, because um, there's always the <clears throat> I don't know if I yeah I never actually uploaded it and I I probably should have. Um, there was a uh, there was a game I played and I actually did record it, but I don't think I uploaded. I, or no, I know I didn't upload it. Um, where my opponent. My opponent over predicted, like he predicted in a situation where he did not need to predict, um, and it literally cost him the game. It was a, uh, it was a um, Garchomp versus my Infernape, and instead of going for the EQ, obviously just to kill it outright, or even the Outrage, he went for a Stone Edge to try and hit my my Zapdos switch in. Um, and fun fact, apparently Garchomp Stone Edge does not one hit KO a full health Infernape. Um, that's something Great. I that's something I did not realize um, but it, it ended up losing him his Garchomp and then Infernape still had like 20% left which obviously that's two attacks with Life Orb which means that's two more dead Pokemon um, and the the amount of like the Pokemon he had left the, he had options for even if I did switch in that, that Zapdos like even if I went into Zapdos and he went EQ and it missed um, he had like an he had uh, he, what he had was a Tyranitar he had a full health Tyranitar that 100% could have just countered anything I tried to do with that um, with that Zapdos and yeah of then, course and so like he just over predicted and it, it literally it cost him the whole game 
Um, that doesn't sound like a linear versus nonlinear, though. That's just something. Oh no, 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 no. But th that was just something I wanted for like my prediction video. Like when I was when I was saying like you know. Oh okay. You don't need to predict and like even even if you think something bad will come out of it, like it doesn't matter matter when like an over prediction can cost you the game. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think we've pretty much we pretty much both covered what we want to talk about at the very least. I sort of. Yeah. Wish I sort of wish Kevin was still here so he could ask questions. Yeah. Well, we he's a fucker. Him. We should so. both call him right now. Pretty sure he went to bed like 20 minutes ago. Oh, right. It's midnight where you guys are, isn't it? I mean, I stay up till 6 a.m. That's me. Yeah. Some of us have to work in the morning. Hey, I am at work. <laughs> That's true. You are. I'm just glad you haven't gotten any emergency calls so we could hear it over the, uh, we could hear it over the video. Yeah. That'd be legal. Very legal. Um, well, do we have any closing comments? Anything we want to talk about? Talk about then yeah. to add in. Pink Reaper signing out. <laughs> that's that's really what I was thinking. Like, that's pretty much it. Or are you just saying that you don't like it when I say that? <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I'm. That's my way of saying I'm done. Yeah, I think I'm done too. Um. So I'm thinking. I don't know what I want to do the next video on. Um. But whatever it is. I think I, I think I'll do prediction. I think I will end up doing prediction as my next video. Um, I might do a a terms a terms video, um, so people actually so people who have no idea what we're talking about can maybe finally understand what we're talking about. Um, yeah, sure. But at the very least, the next main the next main video for Pokemon 101, the next the next actual uh, teaching video will be prediction. And I don't know if you want in on that one, do you? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, if if nothing else, I might not do a Skype call, but if nothing else, I'll get all your uh, I can I can definitely get your ideas and stuff like that. We can we can brainstorm on that one. I'll do a write up on the manipulation of prediction. That's something nobody talks about. It's cool. You you know what will end up happening is you'll talk about prediction in game, and I'll talk about prediction out outside of game about how like I I literally predict out before the game even starts. <laughs> It'll be exactly like this video. Great. But I think for the time being, that's going to be it, guys. Uh, thanks for watching guys this has been Pink Reaper and Umbreon Mao signing out